Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and I want to thank you so much for tuning in today to Welcome Home. You might remember that on June 26, 2015, the Supreme Court ruled by a 5-4 vote that the Constitution guarantees a right to same-sex marriage. So, our program is a slightly different format than we usually have, but without a doubt, you're going to love the discussion. We're calling today's show, Just Ask. You know how the Bible teaches us in James 1-5 that if we lack wisdom, all we have to do is ask God, and He gives liberally. Well, today we are just asking the pastors and a state representative what this recent Supreme Court ruling legalizing same-sex marriage will mean to our culture and society. We brought together several of our esteemed local pastors that you probably know and love from our station to help us understand the implications of this decision in regard to our religious freedom. Also, we'll find out how we should respond as winsome, influential Christians. We'll see what our pastors have to say about this earthly redefinition of marriage and how it will affect the church as well as our society. We've got lots of questions and we're going to get lots of answers from our pastors and even attorneys later on in the show and our state representative on this very difficult, challenging and controversial Supreme Court decision. We are honored today to have with us on our panel. Are you ready for this? We have State Representative Scott Plakin from District 29. We have Chris Walker from the Cathedral of Power. David Jock, who is the senior pastor at the Kingdom Church, as well as, now this is a long title, so bear with me here, Father John Gill, we know and love Father. He is the Vicar General of the Diocese. He's also the Chancellor for Canonical Affairs. Did I say all that right, Father That's John? Correct. That's My correct. My goodness, we are so honored to have these gentlemen here with us today. And we want to start off our program letting you, our viewers, know that this is a difficult subject to be talking about. And as you listen, I hope that you'll listen with an open mind. These gentlemen have done a lot of research. They have lots of discernment and insight. These are tough questions. Sometimes there are black and white answers, sometimes not. So I'm very interested and curious to see what their responses are. But here's what I want you to hear from me and to know that we at Good Life 45, we are really here to try to get wisdom from God. God, because we want to come across as being non-judgmental, although we have to judge certain things that the Bible tells us are right and wrong, and we want to come across as winsome and loving and influential in our Christian walk. So it's going to be great. Father John, why don't I start with you? Would you tell us why we as a church, as a society, and obviously you're from the Catholic Church, why we as Christians believe in marriage as we do? Well, that comes directly from the scriptures. Uh, we heard from Genesis specifically that uh, we as Christians are, uh, or even as, as human beings, were created uh, male and female. And, uh, and we hear, uh, and St. Paul proceed to say that, uh, that, that our faith uh, and our relationship with Christ is the same as marriage. Uh, so it, it's very important for us to, uh, to see that, that importance of, of what uh, following the scriptures and what, uh, what the sacrament of marriage is. Uh, so uh, it, it's uh, something different uh, than what we believe. Why don't we hear from um, Scott? Would you tell us, you are a representative here in District 29, what, um, why do we not embrace same-sex marriage? Well, for about 5,000 years, uh, marriage through hundreds of cultures, civilizations has been, been defined as between one man and one woman. And we find ourselves now, both as citizens of this country and of, uh, as believers, uh, now facing, as of late last June, a different definition of marriage that was put, put forth by five uh, Harvard or Ivy League uh, lawyers that have essentially uh, put these beliefs as law upon the rest of our country. Uh, 30 states have voted to define marriage as a man and a woman, but the actions of these five justices now have changed all that. So we're really talking about, as you said in your opening, the change in a definition of a word. As recently as 2009, Webster's Dictionary defined marriage as between one man and one woman. So both uh, the church now has to see what this means going forward. Uh, the church, both Catholic and the Protestant and others, I know their job is to change hearts. As a legislator, uh, we can change laws. 
but it's much better as believers to change hearts because uh, ultimately our laws are a reflection of people's hearts through their elected officials. So Chris Walker, what would your take on that be? You're from the Cathedral of Power. You're obviously a very strong evangelical Christian church. Same-sex marriage, what, are, what is your church believing? What are you believing? Well, our church simply believes um, what the Bible um, has taught us that, again, God has created marriage between a man and a woman. Um, that was God's um, creation from the beginning of time. And so um, that's what we believe, that's what we hold fast to, um, that marriage is between a man and a woman that God created uh, man and woman to proc uh, you know, procreate, um, to reproduce the world. And so um, we just believe what the scripture says about marriage. So what then is the appropriate way though for the church to react and to respond to the gay community? And I'd love to hear your take on this. David Jock, you're from the Kingdom Church, senior pastor. How do we respond? I think we respond just as Jesus responded, by showing love unconditionally. I think ultimately we have to redefine uh, disagreement does not mean hatred or bigotry. I think we have to come to a place where we can learn how to disagree as it relates to Scripture. Scripture for us is not allowing us to judge Scripture, but allowing Scripture to judge us. And so our job as a church is to always be that beacon of light to where they can come receive truth. And we should stand on our conviction as a church body. I think, that, and that's great, I think that we as a body of believers maybe haven't done the greatest job welcoming the gay community into our church when we understand that their traditional moral ethic doesn't exactly align with ours. So how do you think that we should do this to welcome them into the body of believers in an actual church when, you know, I love this question, I, I don't know if I made it up or if I, I saw it somewhere, but it said, how do we welcome the gay community into our church? and yet maintain the traditional morals and ethics and values that we have when there are plenty of straight people in the churches who are indulging in sexual sin as well. What, how do we do that without being total hypocrites? Well, we simply do what we do for everybody. We must embrace everyone that comes into the church. The church is not a perfect place. It's, not, uh, it's, a, it's a place for imperfect people uh, to come and receive the Word of God and to be changed. And so uh, we have to welcome everybody into the church, whether they're gay, they're straight, they're a fornicator, a, a thief. Um, that's what God would want us to do because they all come so that they can um, understand their purpose in God and they could uh, transform their lives through the Word of God. So we have to embrace everybody and love everybody. Um Representative Plakin, I know that you are working on a bill that I would love for you to address. I think you called it House Bill Number 43, which is protection for pastors, the Pastor Protection Act. Can you walk us through that, what that really is? Sure. Uh, a few weeks ago, I filed House Bill 43, and Senator Bean filed the Senate Companion, and I'm working with Representative Cortez here locally as well, that basically says that pastors uh, shall not be required to solemnize any ceremony that would uh, be in conflict with their sincerely held religious beliefs. Uh, that's section one. Section two also provides civil and criminal relief should anybody decide to go there. Uh, one question is asked sometimes uh, by people that oppose this is why is it necessary? Uh, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, four, Section 3 of the Florida Constitution should protect, protect us. But we want to put this extra layer of protection in Florida law because the trajectory of this movement is happening so, so quickly. Uh, for example, five years ago, the president uh, believed in traditional marriage, but in June, we saw the White House lit up in rainbow colors to give you an idea of how fast this is moving. So we think it's a good idea to put this in Florida law so that no pastor should ever have to be required to solemnize uh, something that they may, uh, may, may rely, violate their religious freedom in our country. And Chris Walker, you've been working really hard on this as well. And it's kind of a neat story how you and Representative Plakin came together. But what, what is your take on the bill and how involved in that are you? Well, when, it, when the Supreme Court decision came down, I was actually sitting at my house and uh, just feeling really grieved in my spirit. And, and so I immediately um, decided to um, start a petition called the Pastors Protection Act. And little did I know that um, State uh, Representative um, Scott Plakin was also uh, thinking about the same thing. And so we were connected by another politician uh, that I know. And uh, we just began to work together. And 
within two weeks, we had 23,000 people all over the state of Florida who felt the same passion. Um, and, and again, this, this, this bill wasn't about what the Supreme Court decided, but it was simply about us having the right to preach the Word of God in truth. And does this bill, I know that there was a question a while back, I don't think this bill has anything to do with that, but different um, small businesses that maybe refuse the right or, or, or claim the right to refuse maybe baking a cake for a gay couple or, or, or serving people. I mean, obviously this bill doesn't have anything to do with that, but is there a bill in the making for those people? Because it all boils down, I think, to religious freedom, does it not? Well, right. This is where, really where, as of uh, uh, June 26, this has now gone from uh, same-sex uh, people have the right to marry uh, under our laws now. Now the next phase of this discussion is going to be how this infringes on the freedom of people. You know, 10 years ago, it was uh, from that group, it was live and let live. Now uh, we're having all around the country people's religious right, rights are being pierced. Uh, we're seeing flower shops and bakeries being forced and fined out of business unless they perform these ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So in the Florida House, we have my bill, uh, the Pastor Protection Act. I'm pretty certain that there'll be one or more bills. Uh, in fact, I've talked to members to file to address these businesses that have a sincerely held belief. Some of them, there's one out west that even will, serves uh, baked goods to a same-sex couple, a loving Christian woman. She's 70 years old. Uh, but when it came down to do the marriage, uh, she couldn't do it. So the state is now... Uh, finding her and she's being sued civilly and could lose everything. So this is the next phase of this, is uh, being able to have religious freedom when some people in this country uh, want to force people to do things that they believe violates their faith. This is, falls under the same a aspect as the, as the abortion issue as well, though, doesn't it? It, it, it gives us the uh, understanding that if you allow abortions, then some people are required to administer mm -hmm. abortions or are required to provide insurance for abortions. It falls under the same category so much in the sense that we have uh, uh, the state legislating or uh, unable to legislate uh, what people believe in and that's, uh, that's extremely important. That's, that's what the, the message is being you know, taught that, yay, this is all right and uh, what society says, it's okay and uh, then uh, what do, where does that put churches? It put churches in a, in a quandary regarding what they believe in and what they teach. And I think, uh, I, you, Barbara, you mentioned something about being, being a person that, that, you know, a church that, that uh, how do we respond to gay people? Well, we teach them. We, we, that's what our, our lesson is. We, we bring about uh, an understanding of God's love. And with God's love, it changes us. And that's what, what it's all about. That's what Christianity is all about that we are called to be people of change. And, uh, and we can't be brought into a, such a narrow view of what, what this is all about and, and f to following these laws that, that uh, you know, an infringement of, of religious freedoms. That leads me right into my next question, Father John, and that would be, what are the dangers of Christians being apathetic toward all of these kinds of views and, and these issues? Because I know there'll be some viewers out there today, you may be one of them, they're like, why should we care? You know, everybody should be the same. We should embrace everybody. Yes, we should be loving everybody, but why should we care as Christians about something that's so controversial? There will be hate mail. There will be people calling um, your churches your pastors and saying, why are you taking a stand on this? So why is it important for us not to be apathetic as viewers? Well, I personally, I think uh, we, we have to take a stand. It's like anything else. Uh, if we are being, uh, our religion is being uh, taken away from us, our faith. And, uh, and this country was noted for it. Uh, so much in the sense that, you know, I, this has happened throughout the world. This has happened in many, many cases. Uh, I, uh, for instance, I mean, there are other countries where you, you're civilly married and then you come to the church to get a religious ceremony uh, that occurs. But we don't expect that to happen in the United States. And, but this is where this is leading to. Okay. It's leading to that what it's, you're going to have that, so, that great separation between churches and, and legal. Uh, and if you look at the history, Barbara, the history is the church was the first one who recognized, re recognized what ma marriage was. So the church was the first one who, who, who started listing and, and categorizing that people were married. 
And the idea that the, all of a sudden the, the, the state has, has ripped that out of the church's hands. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what uh, history proves itself in well, that regard. It's actually a little worse than that because yeah. it started out with the church and then small communities and then the state regulated. And we saw the states, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the people voted for marriage to be managed woman, man and woman. So it went from that regulation, state regulation, now what the Supreme Court justices did, it's now federally, federally regulated, uh, which I don't think is in the best interest of the citizens of our country for the federal government to regulate marriage. And the way they regulate it, again, is against thousands of years of, of recorded history. And I think another reason why we should care is because our children are at stake now. Yes. Uh, there's, so many, there's so much curriculum that's being developed to push through the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools to uh, even change their mind and, and redevelop their mindset about what's right and what's biblically wrong. Um, so we, we definitely should care that our children are the next um, frontier um, for the agenda. And so we, we definitely need to speak up now. Uh, for the sake of, uh, of our children. Well, let's jump right into that topic then. And David, I'd love to hear your response on this as well, Chris, all of you guys. But what do we tell our kids when they go to school and they're indoctrinated in with all their friends and social media and everything? Everybody is saying this is great, particularly in Hollywood, and, and they go against the grain. How do we tell our kids to stand up for what they believe in without them being ridiculed and, and marginalized? Well, I think first we have to help our kids understand culture. Uh, culture and Christ are two different things. And oftentimes with my own, I, I have to ensure that they understand we live for Christ as our Lord, as under his submission and rule. Culture changes. Christ's word is pretty much the same consistently all the way through. It's very imperative that we train our children and help them understand why we have the values that we have. And oftentimes scripture doesn't paint us as the majority, it oftentimes paints us as the minority and inf infusing in our children the self-esteem and the self-worth to know that being in the minority is not always wrong, that sometimes to take a stand for something you believe in, you may be in the minority, but we're standing for Christ and not our culture. But that's what Christianity is about. Christianity is, is recognizing that we are different than the rest of the world. I mean, it started that from the Romans on. I mean, the idea that you know, we were different. We were we are the kind of people that that stand out for for something that's that's unique. And uh, I, I, the sad part about it is that we have our our kids being indoctrinated uh, tremendously from from TV to radio to everything. Uh, you know, and it's it, we see we lack that uh, that understanding of a moral moral basis in our society. And that's it's it all boils down to where our society is today. And I think also that we're always trying to make Christianity cool or relevant. And it is relevant. Truth is relevant. And so we always have to emphasize to our children that popularity does not always mean that it's right. And so despite what Hollywood is doing, despite what influential entertainers may uh, voice as absolute truth, it's not absolute. And in a world that has no absolutes, we continually have to reinforce to our children what absolute truths are. And I'm so glad that you brought that up. That was one of my questions about moral, absolute moral truth. There is absolute moral truth as set forth in the Bible, but how do we teach our kids that when society is so countercultural to that viewpoint? What do we say to our kids? What kinds of tools and really tangible strategies can we give them to help them combat what's, what's out there? Well, I think we have to just simply take them, uh, con make sure that they consistently, we take them to the Word of God. Throughout Scripture, um, the Scripture shows um, that Jesus dealt with the culture of His day. Uh, he was constantly um, uh, trying to uh, bring righteousness to an unrighteous culture. And so I think we have to show our kids that, you know, uh, like Pastor Jock said, you know, there's culture and then there's Christ, and we live for Christ and not culture. And so we can't let that culture change us, but we must be the uh, change agents for the culture. One thing that I read, this is from Barna, George Barna, that d who does all the polls and different surveys. He said that absolutely we as Christians are in a minority, particularly on this Supreme Court ruling. 58% of our population right now favors same-sex marriage. So, you know, if that's 42%, if I'm doing the math right in my head, that believe that same-sex marriage is wrong, I mean, I think it's probably less than that. So I think that we really need to be sensitive to what we're doing and what we're telling our children, because if we 
can't handle it. We look like we're haters. We look like we're people that are against the gays and, and we're not at all. We love them. We embrace them as a culture. We don't believe that what they're doing maybe is, is right or is scriptural. But how do we really help our kids with that thought when they are definitely in a minority? Well, I, I would say, uh, Barbara, with those numbers, uh, Christians in a minor minority, with our religious freedoms being pierced, what we're really talking about is uh, we're headed for a time of persecution. Uh, now, the good news is it's not like the persecution that uh, we read throughout history of the Christian church. This is my personal opinion. What I think that this will result in, uh, maybe down the line a little bit, is when Christians are per persecuted, that's often where great revivals come. So this, this uh, in how churches process this, and how they show love through this process to people they disagree with. And even, uh, I have to add, that how churches treat tra traditional marriage will have an impact on this. I think that the Church of Jesus Christ has to bear some of the responsibility from where we are now, because we all, I think, as believers, have to look at our own marriages and people around us to show more examples of what traditional marriage should look like. And I think if we do that, and with the, the kind of soft persecution that's coming, I think that there's an, if you want to look at an upside to this, that there will be a revival down the line sometime that people will look and the church will, uh, all of a sudden that church culture thing will start to flip again. Congressman, I agree with you absolutely because I think this is very cyclical. I, I think when you look at history, you see uh, that constant uh, reversal of, of, of morals back and forth. I mean, I, I came across a cartoon the other day, and it showed uh, the Roman emperor, and he says, we've been trying to ch get the church up to date for 3,000 years, and we still haven't done it. And it's like, it's, oh, that, what's in vogue? And the church has always had its, had its feet stopped to the ground saying, no, we, we believe in what, what Christ has taught. And that's exactly where we come from. Let me get really personal here, because this is going to happen. We all know gay people. We love them. I have them in my circle of, of friends and, and truthfully, some really good friends and some people that I, I, I love and, and want the very best for them. I feel like they're misguided maybe in this area, but I, I, I love my gay friends. So the question is, let's say we have a gay marriage that we get invited to and we want to love and support that person do we actually or i'll just ask your opinion it's obviously not in scripture whether you would do it or not but would you attend a gay marriage for a couple that you really knew and loved real personal chris david well um i personally wouldn't um attend a gay marriage not because i didn't love the individual but um i want to be clear that i don't support what what God doesn't support. I, I think I, I think it's very important that in showing the love of God, I personally would not attend. But as a Christian, I believe that all Christians, all individuals are made in the likeness of God, the Imago Dei. And it's my responsibility as a believer to show love and to politely and kindly express where I stand and where my concerns are. And in a loving way, help them understand where my position is as it relates to not attending um, that ceremony. Father Gill, you're not getting off the hook here. I want to know if that collar is going to a gay wedding. <laughs> <laughs> well, this collar is restricted from going to a gay wedding okay. by ca canon law of the church. Okay. I am not to uh, come attend any wedding that's outside the church that would give the, ex the, the image that the, the church would be protecting or acknowledging mm -hmm. it. So I would be restricted uh, legally. But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't show concern and love for a gay person or a gay couple uh, and, uh, and try to help them to see the love of Christ and to, to grow from that. Uh, and let's face it, we are all sinners. We, are all, we all fail once, one way or another. I mean, there, I have a lot of people who, who are sinners that are uh, not in marriages, that are heterosexual mar uh, relationships that are, that are uh, sinners. But uh, do, I, do I oust them from, from that understanding? No. Would I attend their wedding? No. But, uh, you know, the fact is, is that uh, I recognize that uh, they need help and they need love and uh, they need the support of the church in many ways. So. And, and I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in on that. You know, I think it comes uh, in answering that question to put what homosexuality is in context. Uh, we see it in the church as looked at different, but really at the end of the day, it's as a sin no differently, no different than uh, any other sex outside of marriage. 
So I think we somehow look at it different. I guess it is a little different in that society has glorified that, where they don't glorify, for example, adultery or some of these other things. So it's different in that sense. In terms of going to a ceremony like that, I also have people that are very close in my life that uh, have expressed uh, homosexual, homosexual views. And uh, I've not been asked. And that's a very tough decision, probably, because on one hand, I, I love these people exactly like uh, anybody else. Because again, they're sinners just like all of us. On the other hand, uh, if I've ever asked that, you have to decide, do I want to participate in a ceremony that is glorifying sin? So uh, fortunately, I haven't had to make that decision yet. But uh, it, it's, it's those two things would have to be balanced out. What does it mean to my relationship with the Lord, would you say, as pastors in particular, if I decide that I no longer oppose a gay marriage? There may be somebody out there today who's watching and listening who said, gay marriage is okay with me. Uh, you know, what's, what's God going to say to that person? How does God feel about the person who no longer or does not oppose gay marriage? What do you think about that, Scott, Chris, John? Well, the first thing I think is uh, Pope Francis's response. You know, who am I to judge? Uh, I think of, you know, we are called not to be judged. We are called to be, bring clo people closer to the Lord. And that's the most important part. Uh, you know, we are, we, we are confronted by these things. Uh, and when it comes right down to it, the most important part is our relationship with the Lord. David? I, I agree with Father. I, I think that it's ultimately, uh, this subject is not monolithic in the church, uh, meaning that it's, different from church to church, denomination to denomination. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, God is ultimately the judge. We are not judge and jury, uh, but our hearts is consistently to point out Christ's purpose and plan for eternal, uh, uh, the redemptive plan for humanity. Well said. What about um, another tricky kind of issue that we have? <clears throat> People talk about gay couples who are living together who decide on gay adoption. And there will be some who will say, well, it's better to be in a home where there are two loving people of the same sex rather than to be in a heterosexual home where there's fighting and all kinds of conflict in there. Is gay adoption ever, in your opinion, acceptable? Well, I would say we have to start with what's optimal. Uh, throughout history, and I think uh, statistics would also show this, that the best chance that a child has is with a male and a female uh, raising them, a mother and father, and, and uh, preferably, of course, married. And uh, John Stenberg with Family Policy Council gives a good example. When in raising a baby, they learn different things from the mother and father. For example, mothers can look in the baby's eyes for hours at a time and just look in their eyes. Uh, you try doing that with a father, probably gets you know <laughs> bored after 20 minutes. And he uses an example of fathers you've seen throw their baby up and down, <laughs> you've probably seen before, and that's an interaction, a, a male interaction, and of course the mother's horrified. So these little micro interactions, I think, are what helps optimally raise a child. So I think preferable for society is to have babies raised by mother and father. Uh, we had that come up in the Florida legislature last year where that was actually repealed in Florida law. And here in Florida, they've been going on that now for four or five years, uh, same-sex adoptions. Anybody else on the panel? I, you know, I, I, I know the, the Catholic Church has, has pushed away from uh, a lot of adoptions because of this, this issue. Uh, and I think this is a, basically a civil issue in many ways. But the fact is, is that uh, when I think about adoption po policies and that, I think about, uh, you know, we have less children because we're, we're aborting half of our children that are available. So uh, I, I think we should be using the most optimal uh, couples that are uh, for, uh, for these children. Great. And can I chime in one more yes. thing on the Catholic Church in uh, Massachusetts has actually stopped uh, providing those services because the state of Massachusetts is compelling them to do uh, same-sex adoptions. Yeah. So Catholic Charities is doing this. So there's a, a situation where the Supreme Court ruling, which we started talking about, will have an impact on this. And it's uh, sure. here in Florida, we'll probably see a similar impact. 
I want to be sure that we sort of end this segment on a positive note. So I have one more question for you, and that has to do with Romans 8, 28, which says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It's an important part of it that are called according to his purpose. So can any good come of a Supreme Court ruling? And we kind of made reference to it a little bit about awakening the church and some good things that can come as a result of this. But what are your positive sort of slants on this Supreme Court ruling? And Let's, I'd love for each one of you to answer this question. I think the greatest thing uh, that you just alluded to that has happened is that it has woken the church up um, to many, many, many things, uh, not just, um, it's, it's definitely woken the church up to one that we have to be a little bit more loving in our approach to win everybody that's in sin and not just hammer on one that we don't agree with. And so what it has done, it has confronted the church to say, hey, we've got to figure out how to reach the center with love. I think it's done a, a great deal of awakening the church. As Martin Luther King said, the church used to be the headlight and is now the taillight. I think it's important as the church considers uh, different scenarios that are changing in our culture on how to deal and do ministry for the changing times that we're in, that oftentimes the church is redundant or antiquated in dealing with. I am so grateful to God for this portion of Welcome Home Today where we had such an incredible panel of discussion with all of their wisdom and discernment and insight on this very difficult subject of same-sex marriage. I want to thank legislator Scott Plakin for being here with us today, Chris Walker, David Jacques, and Father John Gill. They were all rock stars and they gave us such great information. We're going to be having a second part of our program coming up for you next with a panel of attorneys. So you're not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you joined us for the second half of Welcome Home. We're talking about a very important subject, and that is same-sex marriage. We've been having just some really good discussion from some pastors, and now we have an attorney panel who's really going to give us their legal perspective, how we're supposed to understand this from their point of view. And I know that there'll be some questions that maybe there aren't any black and white answers for, but they're going to do their best to bless us with this particular segment on Welcome Home. Mark Nation from the Nation Law Firm is here with us today, as well as Karen Eastry, who is with the Law Practice of Alper and Eastry. So we are very blessed to have these two wonderful attorneys here with us today. Thank you so much for being here with us today, guys. Thank guys you. and girl, guy and girl. I think my first question, Mark, needs to be to you. As a practicing wrongful death and personal injury attorney, tell us what the impact is going to be on your practice, because there are going to be some ramifications that maybe haven't been thought out well. I agree. Uh, there are going to be a lot of implications uh, to my practice and starting first and foremost with in wrongful death cases. In Florida, you can only have a wrongful death case uh, because our statutes say you can. Other than that, before we had a wrongful death statute, you couldn't bring a claim for wrongful death. And the wrongful death statute sets forth who can bring the claim. And uh, the peop one of the main people that can bring a claim for wrongful death is the spouse. And with this decision, now that there's a marriage, a uh, gay couple, the one who lives, can bring a claim. Uh, there have been no court cases yet on this particular issue, but what I foresee is a couple of things are going to come up. First and foremost, 
when I'm picking a jury in a case where you have, say, two uh, men who were married, I am certainly going to have to explore with our potential jurors uh, who can and cannot sit on that panel. There are going to be many people who just uh, would not be able to follow the law. If the law is that uh, a surviving man uh, can recover for the death of his husband, I, obviously there are going to be people who don't want to sit in that type of situation. And then there are going to be some who say they can, but then the next question, which I think is going to be more important, is, all right, you think you can, but are you going to, are you going to be willing to give full justice to my client? Or would you give a half measure of justice just because it's a man and another man? So those are important things that are going to have to be explored. Okay. And in injury cases, when there's been a claim, uh, a serious injury to, say, a lady, and then the other uh, lady has a claim, if, it's, uh, if they're married under our state law, has a claim for loss of consortium, which is defined as loss of comfort and services and sexual relationships. I'm going to have to spend a lot of time with our potential jurors to make sure they understand the nature of that claim and to understand whether or not they can give my client full justice based on either upbringing or religious backgrounds. Let's, let's talk for just a minute about employers because there are churches that are, that are employing people, obviously, and then there are secular jobs and employees. So what are the laws? Karen, maybe you can address this. What are the laws in particular with churches in regard to sexual orientation? How important and how, how, how relevant is that today? Well, it's a vitally important question that churches need to resolve. The government or our laws protect churches when they employ ministers. So when a church can label most of their staff as ministerial, whether it's the children's ministry, the music ministry, the visitation ministry, those ministers are protected. The church is not required to go outside the bounds of their doctrinal beliefs to hire others. But the problem is going to really come in is when they have other types of employees, such as staff, office staff, running a, a, day, a daycare center or those types of arrangements. One way that the churches can protect themselves is to have a doctrinal statement in their employee handbook which references their beliefs, their belief systems, and ask the employees to sign an agreement to it. So as, as much as possible, when they can qualify different jobs as ministerial, that protects them under one area. And for those that they can't give the ministerial title to, then having an employee handbook that references the biblical principles that they want those employees to demonstrate, have a biblical standard of living, have a conduct, a code of conduct that they ask their employees to abide by, and then have the employees sign that statement, and that will help protect them. Mark, you've had personal experience with that in your law practice. You said that, I mean, you, you've had to hire gay people or you want to hire gay people. You have the prerogative to do that. Do you, have the, do you also have the prerogative to turn somebody down? In, there are several laws that apply to employers, and we'll start federally first. The federal law says, uh, well, let me back up. All laws say you cannot discriminate against people who are members of a protected class. And that's the most important part of the statute. You have the protected class. And so you look at the statutes federally first and say, who, is, who are the members of a protected class? Well, protected class members are people um, based on their age, based on their nationality, their race, religion. Sexual orientation at this moment is not a protected class federally. So under the federal law, you can fire somebody or refuse to hire them or make an adverse employment decision, that's the language they use, uh, because of sexual orientation. And you would not violate federal law. The EEOC is given certain regulations where they're recommending that nobody discriminate based on sexual orientation, but those aren't binding yet. So that the federal law, you're allowed to discriminate based on sexual orientation. Under Florida's statute, you can also, uh, uh, sexual orientation is not a protected class, and so you wouldn't run afoul of a Florida statute. So you now go to the uh, counties. Orange County and Osceola County have both adopted regulations that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. So those 
folks are uh, members of a protected class. Seminole County has not adopted that regulation. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes very complicated. And I can see uh, the state is going to have to make a decision on whether or not um, sexual orientation is a protected class because I don't think you can have 67 different laws in the state of Florida. It's just going to be too cumbersome and too confusing to employers. And you can't have 50 different laws from 50 different states. So the, the um, United States is going to have to make a decision on whether or not sexual orientation is a protected class. So that's something that's coming. That's uh, coming. It's with, in the making. There's no doubt in right. my mind. Let's, let's talk about kind of back up to the Supreme Court ruling on June 26. Was that a constitutional ruling? or not. I know there's a lot of disagreement about that, a lot of controversy. Constitutional, Mark, or not? The simple answer is five people said it's constitutional. And the way our system works is the Supreme Court is the court of last, uh, mm -hmm. they're the last one to make the decision. That's how the system uh, was created and that's how it is now. That is the law of the land. It is constitutional based on a, uh, those five votes. Now, I suspect the question other people are really asking, or folks are really asking is, is it the right decision? <laughs> is yeah. it the right decision? I can tell you with uh, my cases, when I am in court or in, on an appeal, there are different arguments that I make and different arguments that the other side makes. The court gets to make the decision, and that's the way we live with it. I've not analyzed it in the manner of, is it the right decision? I've analyzed it in, how does this impact us? And I can tell you, my hands are completely full dealing with how does it impact us, as opposed to uh, the uh, academic argument of, was it right or wrong? It's the law of the land, right. and it's going to be for a while. Karen, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I have to agree with Mark that it's now the law of the land, and it's what we have to deal with. I, I would admit that I was a bit surprised when it came down the way it did because jurisdiction over regulating marriage and establishing what the laws for marriage were was a state issue. It had always been deemed a state issue. But also the grounds that it was decided on as far as uh, due process, and we know that in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights, an individual is, is given due process before they are deprived of life, liberty, or property, the right to a same-sex marriage, it's hard to find that within the binds of that limitation of due process. But as Mark said, it is the law now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's once the Supreme Court makes a decision, only rarely do we get a reversal on some other technicality or in, through some other case. So this is what we now have to, to adjust to. So do you both pretty much believe that this will not be disputed, that this is the law of the land forever? No reversal on this decision is likely? I don't see a reversal coming. Okay. And I would agree. Well, I let me it. ask you this question because I love statistics. And Barna, George Barna has all these wonderful polls. He said Americans right now have 13% confidence in the Supreme Court uh, compared to 50% back in the 80s. We just continue to decline in our having confidence with the Supreme Court and with those judges. So. Why do we continue to look to them for guidance, for establishing law in our country? They're in there for the duration. What's wrong with the system, if anything, if we have no confidence in this system? Confidence wasn't one of the requirements in our <laughs> Constitution. You know, the, the, the Supreme Court was designed to be the judicial branch, the branch to determine that the laws were constitutional as enacted by the legislature or enforced by the executive branch. Um, confidence wasn't one of the requirements. Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah. I think that um, it's a symptom of a much bigger problem. And the bigger problem is our politicians who are attacking each other personally day in and day out. And this is just another part of it where they attack uh, the individual judges and say that uh, maybe a a ascribe various motives to them as opposed to simply saying, well, I disagree with the opinion, but this is the way that we are to do business in this country. Uh, you can disagree with the opinion, and I think uh, uh, you're without attacking the judges, and then that confidence level 
is uh, probably going to go up. If we had two doctors or ten doctors and they just attacked everybody, each other, all day, every day, people would say, I have no confidence in the doctors because they're the ones, they're attacking each other. It's just a symptom. Let's talk about the church's tax-exempt status because um, we've heard and read all kinds of things about maybe if a church opposes gay marriage that their tax-exempt status can be taken away. Is that true? Is that something we should be worried about? I do not think it's true. The, the government can't make decisions uh, against anybody, especially a church, uh, based on the content of the message. Any decisions the government makes under the First Amendment have to be content neutral. And so for the government to say, we're going to make a, a change of statutes or regulations because of the content of what you've said is prima facie unconstitutional. And so you can't take away a tax-exempt status from one church because of their message and let another church keep it. Uh, because they have a message that you like better. Hmm. So I don't okay. see that happening Karen? at all. I, I would say when we're looking at the message, you know, the churches are going to be protected by, under the Constitution, they do have complete freedom of belief to their doctrines. When it comes to the application of how the same-sex decision is affecting in their church, we most likely will be facing very soon a problem with the tax exempt status. I know that during the oral the oral arguments, the solicitor general he wasn't willing to really comment on the future as to how the churches whether they would lose their their tax exempt status. But we can go back and look at the United States versus Bob Jones case, which they were in a litigation because they refused to treat interracial couples the same as they would non interracial couples and they lost their tax exempt sta status based on them not using a public policy or what was generally accepted as public policy. And there's been that alarm sounded as far as churches, as churches might become more vocal against same-sex unions or seen as being discriminata discriminating against the same-sex couples, I believe they're very likely going to be faced with that same public policy issue, that they are not upholding the public policy of same-sex marriage, and so their tax-exempt status it can be called in question. Time will tell, right? It Just will. time will tell. So part of the reason that we were established as a nation has to do with freedom, in particular religious freedom. So what do you think uh, same-sex marriage is going, the legalization of that is going to do in regard to religious freedom? Is this something that we need to be concerned about? I think it is. I think there, there will be... Uh, attempts to force uh, churches uh, to perform marriages, and if they don't, uh, I think there could be lawsuits mm -hmm. that uh, come. Whether or not they're going to be successful is something else. You know, we do have the, uh, the Constitution that is going to protect them. We have statutes that protect them. Uh, but we do need the Pastor Protection Act mm -hmm. just as an extra layer of protection, because these are firmly held religious views, uh, and the churches need to be able to uh, not only be protected, but there needs to be no chilling effect on the pastors. They need to be able to say uh, what they believe the Bible says yeah. without any uh, threat, no sort of Damocles hanging over their head, and no threat that they may be sued because of what they're saying they believe the Bible says. Karen, your thoughts on religious freedom? I, I agree wholeheartedly you know, with Mark that the churches are most likely going to be coming under attack as this issue becomes more, more accepted and more embraced that this is now the new America is that we encourage, you know, marriage, whether it's between a husband and wife as male and female or, or two same-sex individuals. And the churches, if they are not careful, can open themselves up to attacks. And, and when I say that, I mean litigation. You know, I, I know in my own church that we've... Um, done a, a great deal of discussing uh, how to make our church documents so that they do protect the church. I, I believe it's vital that every church have a doctrinal statement of their beliefs. Though it, it, that's not the same as the bylaws, it's not the same as the constitution of their church, but it's the, the doctrinal statements. 
And one thing that, that else that's very important to churches is to have those doctrinal statements annotated to the scriptures or to the sacred writings that, that give them the basis for that belief. Our courts have over and over again encouraged the protection of a sincerely held religious belief. We are protected in what we believe. Well, how do we establish what we believe? We establish what we believe by tying it back to the scripture. So, for example, if, it, if we are addressing the same-sex issue, if we annotate our statement of faith back to Genesis, where, you know, the Bible says that God created them male and female, and for this cause shall a man leave his, his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one. Well, we want our, our doctrinal statements to be annotated back to the scriptures in, in all regards, because that's what gives our beliefs a sincerity. It shows that our beliefs are sincere. And then we need to be practicing them. You know, it's yeah. one of the biggest things we our churches can do. Right. Good. Um, I, I know that part of the reason we have laws in our country would be to protect the people. That's why laws are made. So if we know, and we do from statistics and from research, that traditional family is, is in a better place than same-sex marriage. It just is. Traditional family means higher literacy, literacy rates, better health, longer life, lower teen pregnancy, higher incomes. If, in fact, traditional marriage is better for the country, then what benefits can we see from the Supreme Court decision which really redefines what marriage is? I think there are some, uh, there are certainly some detriments, there are some benefits. We, at the point when the decision was made, I think 36 or so states had allowed uh, uh, gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Some didn't, obviously. And then people moving from one state to another, uh, the disposition of property upon death, those types of things, there needs to be an order to that. Mm -hmm. And so it does provide some order, or it does provide order to those things. Uh, you, I, you really can't have in this I issue, probably, uh, states allowing different things, and then you have disposition of property uh, that's different in every state, and then you have disposition, or how do you deal with kids that are adopted? Mm -hmm. So you've got to provide some order to it. This is going to provide some order to that. Mm -hmm. Karen, what are your thoughts? I agree with Mark. While I, it, it isn't what I would have chosen for my nation, it, we do have an issue when we have individuals who go to one state and, and they're legally married there and by a course of events they find themselves in another state where that marriage isn't, isn't acknowledged. And so we have a, a, a patchwork quilt of laws and this decision changes that. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's not what I would have chosen, but it will give our, our nation a unity as far as the structure of family. You don't lose your your right to be married just because you crossed a state line, and that was a problem. Let's look at um, the public school system. Legally, can teachers teach morality as if same-sex marriage is considered to be morally correct? It must be morally correct if the Supreme Court made it a decision, made it legal. I think in the, in the history classes, the, it's going to be taught that it is allowed and it is the law of the land. Uh, the spin on it from each individual teacher is going to be obviously different. How that plays out, I don't know. It's, it's going to be, uh, I think, very different uh, depending on the teacher, yeah. the school, and the district. Yeah. And it's going to be really difficult for parents to figure out how to do this and how to navigate the system. Are your kids going to be in public school? Or are they going to be in private school? Or just Christian school? Just homeschooled? But I think that it needs to be, the subject needs to be broached in every home, how you're going to respond to some of these issues that are getting ready to happen in all of, all of our lives. Karen, what were your thoughts? They've already been going on for <laughs> the last 15 or 20 years. Yeah. And I think if you polled the children in, in a public school setting now, setting now you would find that they've already been taught that this was the right decision. Mm -hmm. So that it, it, it's not going to change what the teachers are saying, not overnight. I know that you're both Christians and Christian attorneys, and I'm so grateful to God for putting you in that arena. Uh, I love um, Romans 12, 1, which talks about not being um, conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we teach our kids? Because I know you're a parent, Mark, Karen, you're a parent as well. How do you teach your children 
to not be conformed when everybody around them is acting like we're the oddballs and that they look like they're out of place and that they're intolerant and that they're haters. How do you teach your kids? Uh, we, we can't forget we are commanded to be joyful. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. commanded to love our neighbors, whoever that neighbor may be. And so if we live that out and if we really follow what Jesus said, I think it makes it much easier. We explain to our kids what the Bible says, but we also show them that we are reading the Bible, that we are following it in every area of our lives. If we're not following it in one area, how are we going to be telling them in another area, you know, you need to be doing this. Mm -hmm. We just need to live it out. Mm -hmm. We need to live it out and be willing to talk to our kids about everything. And I think that's where we start. And absolutely. They, they already know what you believe, whether you've told them or not, because they've seen how you're living. And if your children are used to seeing you lose your temper and, and you swear words that you wouldn't use at church, they know it's just a joke. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's what they've already seen. So I, I think without a doubt, if you polled my five children, they would tell you exactly what mom believed mm -hmm. because they've seen it. They might not agree with it, and I know that in many ways they don't, but they can tell you. Yeah. Our job is to live out our Christian faith and to love and embrace all people regardless of their beliefs, and we hope that they would do the same for us. We can look like we're haters and we're intolerant, but we're not. We want today to make sure that we communicate to you that our love for the, uh, for the gay community is real. It's authentic, and we need to be showing them our love by inviting them to come to our churches, by making sure that they understand um, that, that there may be a sense of, of judging in that we don't feel like what they're doing is right, but we still love them and want them to be, uh, to know Jesus. That's, that's the bottom line. I'm so grateful to God today for bringing these attorneys and pastors across our paths. This has been just a rich show that hopefully is going to give you strength and power and insight and wisdom to know how to handle some very difficult situations that are coming up in all of our lives. I want to thank Mark Nation from, from, um, Nation, from the Nation Law Firm and Karen Eastry for being here with us today. Uh, they've given us their very, very valuable time to talk about this Supreme Court ruling and guaranteeing the right to same-sex marriage, and it is constitutional now because it's a part of the Constitution, what it might mean for us as Christians, for us as a society. So I'm happy that we've started the conversation with our pastors and our guests, and I hope you'll continue it at home with your family. Additionally, I want to invite you to watch for uh, the second part of Welcome Homes Just Ask coming soon with another wonderful panel of pastors and their opinions, as always, biblically based on this same-sex marriage topic. We're excited to hear from other local pastors who are committed to helping us understand this ruling. Thank you all for being here with us today on Welcome Home. And remember, if you want wisdom, just ask God and He will give it to you liberally. I hope to see you again soon. God bless you.